Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, this uh, will be a bit of the same uh, as in Richard's talk. Um, so I start with a with a um, smooth cubic, and then Richard introduced um, this uh, semi-orthogonal uh, decomposition of the derived category. So there was the bit uh, that is of interest to us. So this AX, let me recall, was uh, uh, given as the orthogonal complement, um, right orthogonal complement of this exceptional um, collection. And uh, the goal is, uh, is I'd like to understand uh, the group of outer equivalences. So what I mean by this is uh, the group of isomorphism classes of uh, k-linear exact equivalences. And in particular, I'd like to understand this group for uh, general x. So later, I hope uh, during the talk, I'll convince you that this group is, uh, is an interesting group. Um, I have nothing to say about rationality, but uh, since uh, at least we all believe that the um, generic um, cubic shouldn't be rational, it might be interesting to study this category uh, and its group of outer equivalences for very general cubics. Uh, as I say, I have, I have no idea whether this gives us any, any information about rationality or not. OK, so the main technical tool is, uh, is Hodge theory. So as, as before, and uh, as, uh, um, I have to re repeat a few things. So first of all, uh, there exists the unique embedding of the lattice A2 into uh, the extended K3 lattice. So A2 is uh, the quadratic form with this intersection form. Um, lambda here is the K3 lattice. And uh, U is my notation for the hyperbolic uh, plane. And uh, this embedding is unique. So it's a primitive embedding up to the uh, group of orthogonal transformation of lambda tilde. And I'm also interested in its uh, orthogonal complement. And we have seen this orthogonal complement. This was isomorphic up to sine to the primitive cohomology of a cubic. Okay, so these lattices, if I look at the signature, um, this is uh, positive definite. The lambda here is uh, 319, so this is H2 of a K3 surface. Then the hyperbolic lattice is uh, 1, 1. So lambda tilde, the extended K3 lattice, has uh, signature 420. And uh, for A2, uh, we have uh, 220, A2 orthogonal 220. OK. So now if I look at the period domains associated to these uh, two letters, that is, so that's, that's somehow too small. So look at the period domains for these. I call them um, D. So this is the period, the usual period domain um, in, uh, in uh, A to C in this projective space. Then uh, I look at the bigger one. Uh, in this lattice. So these are the usual period domains of positive planes in, um, in these uh, two lattices. Uh, so just recall the dimensions. So this is, uh, this is uh, uh, 20 one dimensional, D is uh, 20 dimensional, this is uh, 23 dimensional, and this is uh, 22 dimensional. So I think of these D, of these two period domains, this one is the period domain for uh, cubics. And this Q is the period domain for um, generalized uh, K3s. Uh, I'll explain a bit uh, about generalized K3s later. So the question is, so we have roughly the period of cubics here, the period of uh, generalized K3s there. What can we learn from this picture uh, for our uh, category AX and its group of, uh, of outer equivalences? 
Okay, so uh, I better first recall a few things uh, about uh, about K3 surfaces. So uh, if S is a K3 surface, then so this is the my definition. Lambda is just uh, isomorphic to its uh, uh, second cohomology, and the extended lattice is isomorphic to the cohomology, the full cohomology uh, of of Z. Usually in this in this uh, story, we change the sign in the hyperbolic plane. It doesn't change the uh, abstract isomorphism type of this lattice, but we also later forget about the grading, and that's why we put a tilde here. So that's the usual cohomology of S, but somehow we forget about the um, uh, about the grading. And uh, so then we say that a point in the period domain Q is uh, is uh, K three if um, if uh, the hot structure defined by x, so each x, each point in the period domain defines a hot structure on this on this lattice. If the hot structure defined by this x is actually hot isometric to the hot structure uh, associated to some uh, to some K three surface S, so if there exists an S such that the hot structure uh, defined by x is hot isometric. So there's one. And we say uh, x is a. Uh, so, 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 not necessarily the K3 U part is a part number. Yeah. Uh, well, somehow, I've, in this, this isomorphism doesn't respect the decomposition, uh, it doesn't respect the grading. So, so, you, so you, you could have a K3 point in which it's like a hyperbolic plane. It's not a hyperbolic Not this one, but of course, there will always yeah, no, be a. Course, yes. Not this one, no, no. And I say x is a twisted K3 if there exists an S plus a Brouwer class such that the hot structure of x of x is uh, hot isometric to uh, the hot structure of the twisted K3 surface. Now later say. Uh, Recall what is uh, really meant by, by this. So in any case, um, with this definition, I have two subsets uh, of my period domain, namely those of uh, K3 points and those of twisted K3 points. Ah, the um, yeah, I should have said this. Yeah. So by definition, this H, the, you're asking for this hot structure. What? Um, so uh, the two zero part of this one is the usual two zero, and uh, and some of the H zero and H four becomes part of H one one. Okay. So or I could also say everything that's orthogonal to it is is one one. Um, yes. Okay, and then there's a little lemma. So how can we see when when is a, uh, when a point X is of K3 type? In fact, this is uh, related to Kieran's question. This is the case if and only if there exists a, a primitive hyperbolic uh, plane in the 1, 1 part of X. Okay, so each X defines a hot structure on this extended lattice lambda tilde. It has a 1, 1 part. And if there exists a hyperbolic plane that's mapped primitively into this one, then that's, uh, that's uh, of K3 type. And also, it is um, a twisted K3 point if and only if there exists the primitive embedding of some twisted hyperbolic uh, lattice. So this one here is a hyperbolic plane, but uh, I multiply by, by some n. Of course, I want n not to be zero. Okay, so there is a there is a clear condition for uh, for points to be of K three type or twisted K three type, and that allows uh, allows one to describe these uh, these uh, sets. Uh,
Yeah, so the, maybe I should stress the, the twisted K3 surfaces do not contain a hyperbolic, hyperbolic plane in general in, its, uh, in the 1, 1 part. Uh, if they do, then they were actually untwisted. Okay, and the corollary is that this uh, 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 K3 points, uh, this is just the intersection of all uh, um, uh, linear spaces perpendicular to uh, hyperbolic planes sitting in, in lambda tilde. So each thing like this is a P, I forgot the dimension, 21. And uh, so that's a co-dimension two subspace. It's a co-dimension two condition. So these are co-dimension uh, two uh, conditions. And the same here, the twisted K3s, um, they are the intersection with uh, all these primitively embedded uh, uh, twisted, hyper twisted hyperbolic planes in, in lambda tilde. So both spaces are, both sets are co-dimension two, so they're countable union of co-dimension two subsets. Um, but the, the, the interesting thing is if you intersect this now with D, so maybe I put this here, if, if you intersect this with D, these become uh, Noether left shift divisors as, uh, as in Richard's talk. Uh, so if I define DK3, so these are, Oops. So these are co-dimension one conditions. And uh, so this is a countable set of, uh, countable union of neutral Lefschetz devices. Okay. So now I'd, I'd like to look at, at this also from the um, cubic point of view and to describe these two, uh, two low size and then we get, uh, get an answer to one of the questions. <laughs> Richard's talk. No, 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 uh, because again, this is this is co-dimension one. So the generic cubic won't have. Um, no, you you get the answer. No. Um, so let's look at these uh, spaces from the uh, uh, cubic perspective, and then. There was this set uh, D. Uh, this is this is this is Richard's D, um, where I intersect the cubic period domain with uh, everything that's orthogonal to some uh, rank two lattice in H four of discriminant. So this is rank two and discriminant. Um, Okay, and uh, so uh, uh, has it has first of all this this condition this this space is not empty if uh, d is congruent zero or two mod six, and then he has uh, the description of the intersection. So this also has it uh, that d k three is in fact the union of all d d's with d. Uh, uh, satisfying um, satisfying this condition star. So let me recall this is uh, this condition star means these two conditions, th th this condition plus another one, namely that four nine and every prime congruent two mod three. Do not all these numbers do not uh, divide D. That's the that's the condition to be to be um, K three. And uh, and a similar uh, computation proves the following. So the space of twisted K threes is also a union of DDs uh, with D now satisfying uh, 
um, so first of all, I keep this condition. So D is congruent, uh, equivalent to 0, 2 congruent modulus 6. And then uh, 2 times D is a, in its prime decomposition, uh, there might be primes uh, congruent to mod 3, but if there is such a prime, then it has to occur with an even or even power. So if pi i is congruent to mod 3, then and i has to be even. So in particular, not all of the of the special cubics are, are are twisted uh, twisted k three. Okay. Oh, because I work upstairs, because why I don't have just one? Because I, I, I work upstairs in the pure domain and not in the, in the quotient. OK, so, that, that's, so that's the, the space is irreducible once I divide out by the orthogonal group. But since I work with different lattices, I didn't want to work in the, in the quotients. The 2D should be, is, the prime decomposition of 2D can contain primes congruent 2 mod 3, which are not, not there here. But if they do, then the, they have to appear with. Because then I, cannot, then I can also treat 2. So for instance, 2 can divide. Up, up here, 2 can be divide d, but not 4. If I put 2 times d, then 4 it can divide. OK. So um, in this paper by Eddington and Thomas, um, they they associate to this to this um, K three category associated to a cubic the hot structure, which I call uh, H tilde A X Z. So that's the hot structure. As and as a lattice, this is uh, this is isomorphic to lambda tilde. One way to see it, uh, you go to one special cubic uh, for which you know that AX is the, is the derived category of the K3 surface, and then you take the, uh, the hot structure of the K3 surface. Uh, but they actually also give a direct construction uh, using the topological K3 of this, um, of this, uh, of this category. So, and then um, another way to, to, uh, to look at these spaces is, so X, so then x is um, k3 period if and only if there exists an s such that the Hodge, the, the Hodge uh, structure um, defines. So this x, so suppose this x corresponds to a cubic, then I can, uh, can look at this category. I look at, this, at, at its Hodge structure. And the period of the cubic was a k3 period if and only if this one is Hodge isometric to uh, To the odd structure of a K3 surface. Okay, so somehow my my emphasis is a little different. Richard was talking about the primitive cohomology in H2 of S, uh, but you can also phrase this just forgetting about the, the the grading, just in terms of the of the full odd structure. And similarly for the twisted ones, uh, uh, that's the case if and only if uh, there exists the twisted K3 surface now, such that. Um, I get these uh, these hot structures, and so now the hope is that that as in Richard's talk, uh, everything I know about uh, derived categories of K3 surface and, and twisted derived categories uh, can be used to get uh, get information about uh, about outer equivalences of this category. So, so the hope is use uh, S and S alpha to get information. About this one. Ah, I'll, I'll talk about this uh, a bit later. Okay, actually, in, in two minutes. Um, so, in order to uh, 
to make clear what, I, what kind of information about S and S alpha I want to use, I will recall the, the things we know about, about derived categories of twisted K3 surfaces. So some of it uh, was in Richard's talk already, but uh, not all, everything. So uh, Richard mentioned uh, this, the following thing, that uh, if I have two K3 surfaces, then their derived categories are equivalent if and only if their Hodge structures are Hodge isometric. So this is uh, by work of Mukai and Orloff. So now I, I want to state the same for the twisted thing. So now I really better recall what this uh, definition of the Hodge structure is. So um, if uh, Alpha is a Brouwer class. So maybe in the complex setting, I think of the Brouwer class as the torsion part of this cohomology. So in particular, I can lift by the uh, um, by the exponential sequence. I can lift every class in here to uh, class in here, and in fact, I can lift it to cohomology class and rational coefficient. So if I choose a class B, a rational cohomology class here that maps to alpha, I use this B. So I'm not able to, to produce directly a hot structure to this class alpha, but I first need to choose a B lift of it. And then in terms of this B, I can define a hot structure. And then later on shows that the isomorphism type of this hot structure does not depend on the, on the choice. So, um, and one way to say this is, so if uh, um, H20, is uh, I choose a generator, uh, so sigma is a two zero form, then the two zero um, of the twisted K3 surface, so now there is, there's actually a choice, I use this choice, is uh, the class uh, sigma plus sigma wedge B. So the sigma is still uh, a, an H2 of, of the original surface, and this would be an H4. But somehow, once I do this, I forget about the grading. So that's now my 2, 0, two zero class. And I can also say what it means for the 1, 1 part. So the 1, 1 part of the, of the twisted K3 surface is, while well, I apply the exponential of B, so which would be this class, um, so I'm sorry, may I write this with a plus? So this is an H0. This is the class B of degree 2. And then I take B square over 2 which is a class in H4, I multiply it with the standard, uh, with the uh, H1, the one, one part of the untwisted K3 surface. But now B was rational, and so B squared over 2 is a priori rational. So this might not be in the, in the integral cohomology, but if I intersect it with, a full, with the integral cohomology of SZ, this is, uh, this is the one, one part of, of, the twisted, of the twisted K3 surface. Okay. So either way, either you, you, just, you determine the 2, 0 part, or, uh, and then from there you deduce this description, or uh, yeah, I think in any case you have to, you have to give the 2, 0 part. You're talking about this subletters? Yeah. Yes. In, in, Yes. Right. I mean, the underlying lattice is, is always lambda tilde, uh, but some of the one-one part gets 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 rotated by this exponential uh, exponential of b. Okay. And here you can also see why you lose the hyperbolic plane. So in here there was a hyperbolic plane u, and some of the one-zero. So this h tilde one-one. This remember this h. Of, of S, uh, Z, this always, always has H0, and then there's the, the, the traditional H11, Z, UG2, and then there's an H4. And some of this H0 survives. This will always be 1, 1 also with respect to the twisted structure. But the H4 won't, because here you have to multiply to make it integral. And, and that, uh, that creates the U, UNs, or the twisted hyperbolic, hyperbolic plane, 
instead of the original u. Okay, but in any case, so the um, the uh, the theorem then is is um, and that's uh, that's the theorem we proved with Stellari that uh, two K three surfaces. Uh, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, before I should have said um, said something about the, about this twisted category. So if I have an S alpha. So this Brouwer class, as I said, was a torsion class oops, in here. So I represent, I represent this alpha by a core cycle. And then I define twisted sheaves. So on the usual gluing uh, uh, property of, of, uh, of the transition function of a Korean sheaf are uh, twisted by, this, uh, by these um, uh, scalar functions. And uh, this way you also get this is one way to think of these things. Uh, you get an abelian category of co twisted Korean sheaves, and the bounded derived category of this one is what I denoted dB of S alpha. Okay. Okay. Um, now. Okay. So there are two things. I can always. I can always. Uh, change B by an integral cohomology class and by a cohomology class in H11. That won't affect uh, won't affect the alpha. But that's the, the only the only choice. Can, can we return Yes. So the isomorphism type of this hot structure does not depend on this choice. Ah. Um, It's a bit. I'm not sure. It's probably asking. It's probably the same as asking whether I can define a natural, and that I don't know. Okay. Um, so now, um, and then the the theorem we. We proved was that uh, two twisted K3 surfaces are derived equivalent if and only if there exists a Hodge isometry uh, between um, between the two. Unfortunately, there's a little technical point. I, I don't want to want to go into this. Uh, this, the story is not as complete as, as in the untwisted case. We have to assume that this one is orientation preserving. But let, and I don't know whether it's superfluous or not, uh, but it's just not. Um, so there, this lattice has four positive directions, and I give it one orientation. So um, it has. It comes with a natural orientation from here because it has. So two positive directions make up for the two zero. They come with a natural orientation, and then the other one from the Kähler Kähler structure. And I want this to, preser to be preserved. Okay. So um, now I want to talk about the the group of outer equivalences, and there is a natural map representation of. Of um, so again, this is the group of linear exact outer equivalences, and everything uh, like this is of Fujimukai type, and that allows me to define an action on cohomology. And uh, since the Fujimukai the Fujimukai can is algebraic, it preserves the hot structure. So and I get I get uh, an action uh, on this um, on this hot structure. And uh, one has to show that was also done by uh, by Mukha and Orloff in the untwisted case that it preserves our structure and preserves the the, the uh, pairing. And now, once you have this representation, there are two questions: uh, what's the image, and what's the kernel? Um, and both. Are related to the Hodge theory, 
uh, of the surface or the twisted surface. Some of the image more obviously more directly, but also the kernel is essentially called, uh, um, controlled by, by the Hodge, uh, by just this, uh, this structure. So let me start with the image. Um, so this is where, where I also want to motivate why this, uh, this group of outer equivalents is uh, supposed to be interesting. Um, okay, so first, let me go to the untwisted case. Um, first of all, every automorphism of the K3 surface, of course, uh, it defines also an equivalence of the boundary of category. And uh, uh, by the global Torelli theorem, this action is faithful on, on the cohomology. And uh, we actually know what the image is. It's actually not as nice as one would like it to be. So it's not the full, uh, uh, full group here. But um, um, uh, if I take the semi-direct product with the, the vial group, generated by all smooth rational curves in X, then uh, this thing becomes um, the automorphism group of just H2. So this is all part of the package of the global trade theorem. And there's one little thing. There's a, I have to put a plus in here. And that uh, is the part that preserves the positive directions, the positive, the component of the positive cone uh, in, in H2. And uh, somehow the, the answer is, is even nicer for, for um, uh, um, for the full auto equivalence group. Um, uh, here it says that. Uh, if I look, so this is, would be the, the full image. This is, in fact, uh, just the full group on the right-hand side. Where, again, this plus means uh, to preserve now the orientation of these four, four positive directions as, uh, as up here. OK. So in, in principle, this allow, I mean, this tells us we can describe this, this image completely just in terms of Hodge uh, theory, but it doesn't tell us why this group could be interesting. Okay? And I, although it's not strictly relevant to the talk, so I'd like to make this point here. Uh, this, this is for arbitrary or generalized? That's for arbitrary, yes. I mean, I'm talking about projective k at this point. So um, let me first convince you that this group out S okay, is, uh, is, uh, can be very interesting. Um, and how do I study this, this group? So how do I say that, a, that a, usually an infinite group is interesting? But I could uh, try to understand what are the finite subgroups contained in here. And that's a classic result by Mukai. He says if G is a finite group, then the following two conditions are equivalent. There exists a K3 surface and even a polarized K3 surface plus an embedding of G into um, the automorphism of S fixing the polarization, and uh, he also looks at symplectic automorphisms, so that uh, this, these are the ones acting trivially on H2, 0. So this condition is equivalent to the second condition, that there exists an embedding of this finite group G into a mature group M23, and this mature group um, this mature group is, a, is an index 5 subgroup of M24. And M24 can be explained uh, easily uh, in terms of the orthogonal group um, of some Niemeyer letters. So here, this N is a particular Niemeyer lattice. So there are 24 lattices, positive definite of rank 24. Uh, and this is the one with root lattice uh, 
consisting of 24 copies of, of A1. And if you determine the orthogonal group of it, then it's uh, this thing, and these, uh, these groups M23 and M24 are uh, sporadic simple groups. And, uh, and there's another condition I have to put on this embedding, namely that the invariant part has to have at least rank 5. So this group M24 is rather big. Ah, uh, uh, now of course I forgot. I wanted to memorize this, but I don't. Uh, ten. Uh, the number itself is not so interesting. The prime factors are interesting. So the prime factors are. Uh, oops, twenty. Three. So with uh, some powers. Um, so this group is rather big. In fact, these finite groups that really do appear are, are actually rather small. The maximal order is 960. Well, that's this number, number here. So and now there's a, there's a derived version of this that shows that, in fact, the group becomes even more interesting when I go to the, uh, to the derived outer equivalences. And, um, So this, this relation between automorphisms of KT surfaces and uh, these Niemeyer lattices, uh, we don't know whether this is a coincidence or whether this is uh, uh, something deeper. So we don't know any direct uh, link between K3 surfaces and this Niemeyer lattice. Although this is also ranked 24 as the extended K3 lattice, the lattices are completely different. But some of them seem, seem to, to be linked. And here's a derived version. And uh, this uses work of a, a physicist, Gabadil Hohenegger and Volpato. So it's essentially the same statement for G a finite group. The uh, following conditions are equivalent. There exists the K3 surface S. And now instead of a polarization, I go up to the derived category. Uh, I fix a stability condition plus an embedding of G into the out group of auto equivalences of DBS. And now the polarization is also here replaced by sigma. I don't need to explain what all this means, but uh, I think the analogy makes it rather clear. And I also want it to be symplectic, meaning that it acts trivially on H20. Uh, OK, and this is equivalent to well, being uh, realized, uh, this is the second condition, being realized as a subgroup of, um, of uh, a Conway group, which is the orthogonal group of the Leach lattice. So the Leach lattice is, is another one of the Niemeyer lattices, but that's the one with, uh, without any roots. So the root lattice would be trivial in this, in this case. And this group is much, is much bigger so the, the order of this group is uh, something like a times uh, 10 to the 19. 15. So in principle, these groups could be much bigger than the ones we have encountered as symplectic automorphisms of K3 surfaces. But I must admit that I haven't been able to actually compute those maximal groups. I don't know what the maximal order is. But in principle, that should be computable. And there's also another condition matching this one. And that's the condition that the invariant lattice should be at least of rank 4. OK. So uh, I hope this, this, uh, this convinces you uh, why, these, why these groups could be interesting, because they contain interesting um, finite subgroups. We still don't know whether, uh, whether there's a deeper link between these lattices, um, but this is what, what comes up. So in fact, you can also replace uh, the result is the same if you replace uh, untwisted K3 service by twisted K3 service. That remains, uh, remains unchanged. OK, so um, now I have to say something about the kernel before I can actually state um, my results. So the first thing is, is a result which I proved with Macri and Stellari. And that says that uh, if there's no root 
uh, no 1, 1 class, that's a root, so no 1, 1 class of square 0. So delta is always the set of roots. So I look at the 1, 1 class, and I look at the set delta of all square minus 2 classes. So these are generalized, uh, these curved classes coming up in the, in the, in the vial group. So where's the vial group here? These Cs are minus 2 classes, and these are more general classes. And if there's no root, then the kernel of, the, of rho is, in fact, uh, very simple. So uh, there's always something in the kernel. Namely, I can, in the derived category, I can shift the complex. I can shift it by 1. That would act by, by minus 1 on the cohomology. If I sh shifted it by 2, then it acts trivially on cohomology. So at least uh, there's the double shift in there and, of course, all multiples. But that's all. So if there's no root uh, in the 1, 1, in the one, one part, then the kernel is, very, is, is as small as possible. Julie? Julie, question? What's delta? So delta is the set of roots of minus two classes. Okay. Um, uh, warning, um, if, um, if I look at, at untwisted K3 surfaces, that never happens. An, an honest K3 surface always has minus two classes. Uh, namely, uh, uh, the class, so note, uh, delta is never empty for untwisted. So this, th this theorem this say, doesn't say anything about, about untwisted K3 surfaces. Okay. So for instance, the, every line bundle would give rise to a minus, to a minus 2 class in the 1, 1 part. Um, so in the... And some of the, this, the, 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 these things I'm, I'm working on right now are all about using this, using this twisted, uh, twisted uh, information for, for cubics. So when we prove this, this was somehow the first case of a, a first algebraic um, instance of a, a verifying conjecture by Bridgeland. Um, but somehow, in principle, in Bridgeland's conjecture, we are interested in untwisted K3 service. So we proved this because that was the only thing we could prove. But now I think it's, uh, it's actually useful in the, uh, in the context of, of cubics. And last year, last year, Bridgeland and uh, Bayer, they actually managed uh, to describe the kernel for untwisted K3 service, at least uh, in the a very general case. So Bayer, Bridgeland, they proved if, if the Picard number is 1, then the kernel, so it's, 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 it's nothing small at all. It's much more complicated than uh, this z. So there are, uh, there are plenty of braid groups in there. But it is determined uh, just by, by the roots. Uh, in a second, I'll give a more precise version for, for, um, for cubics so that uh, you can see what the... Uh, what the conjecture behind this really looks like. Um, okay, so now I want to come back in the last uh, ten minutes. So to a cubic, cubic um, K three categories. And I would like to use this information to to say something at least uh, about. Um, Uh, very general cubics. So, uh, maybe I'll read this away. Okay, so. Oh, because uh, uh, if you look at, for instance, this, there's, there's always this hyperbolic plane from, from H0 and H4. Uh, and that, that contains a minus 2 class. Uh, but there are plenty. If I twist by, by a Brouwer class, well, it depends. There might, might, other, might be other classes that. So, not, not, every, so not, every, not every twisted, honestly twisted K3 uh, would have uh, no roots, but a dense set of those will have. So the line bundles do not survive when I twist, but uh, some of these uh, rigid vector bundles might, might survive the, the twisting. Okay. Um, 
So where was I? Yeah. So now let's look, again look at, at, uh, at the cubic and at this uh, KP category. OK. Um, so now the conjecture, which uh, really is just mimicking uh, Bridgen's conjecture, would say that, uh, that there exists a short exact sequence of this type. So I'm, I'm looking at outer equivalences of this category. I want every outer equivalence to act on homology. Um, and then there's the kernel, so I call this rho. And there's a kernel of rho, and this kernel should be described as a fundamental group of, so what I take, I take the 1, 1 part, the integral 1, 1 part of Ax, complexify it, and uh, take out all uh, hyperpla the hyperplanes to, to all minus 2 classes. So usually they're infinitely many, uh, and uh, so this creates a very often not finally generated uh, fundamental group. And the kernel should be, should be this one. So this is part of the conjecture. And the image should be the group of orientation-preserving um, orientation preserving Hodge isometries of, uh, of the Hodge structure associated to uh, the K3 category coming from the, from the cubic. There are obviously uh, there are, there are, uh, problems with this conjecture. First of all, I don't even know how to define the, the sigma. So in the, in the K3 case, uh, one first uses a theorem by all of saying every equivalence uh, is actually a Fuyamukai type. Um, that I can't use here. Uh, also, all the, the existing results about uh, Fuyamukai um, functors don't, don't seem to apply. So I don't know what to do. So uh, I just go on and say I'm only looking at those that are of Fuyamukai type. I'm just not interested in, in, in or the other ones, because for the other ones, I don't know how to do, 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 to do the deformation theory anyways. OK. And then the natural interpretation of this conjecture uh, uh, of Bridgeland was in terms of stability conditions. And we don't even know whether this AX has any stability conditions at all. Um, 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 so a stability condition, the way you could think of a stability condition is first in terms, any stability condition gives you a bounded T structure. And then you look at the heart of this bounded T structure. And that comes with some kind of polarization. So that's the stability function. And even proving that this heart here, this, this, this uh, uh, triangular category, has a bounded T structure at all. That's not, not, uh, not uh, I mean, it's not true. I think I know. I know an argument using results of, of Keller, but a priori, there's no reason why this should have a bounded, uh, bounded T structure. Um, so in this sense, we, uh, we, we, don't, we are not at the same uh, level of understanding as for, for K3 services. So now I should uh, state what I, uh, what I wanted to say. Say again, please. No, he, well, as far as I understand, he looks at certain cases where he interprets this AX as in terms of matrix factorizations, but it doesn't work for all cases. These are very special potentials uh, he's looking at. At least I don't know. I mean, he constructs these very special stability conditions for some cubics, but not for all. No, not Tone. Sorry. Tone and Tone, I believe, is Oh, but then you. Yes, but you need to lift the equivalence to uh, an enhanced to the enhanced category, yeah. and so that that's the, that's a problem. And first of all, you have to, to show that there's natural enhancement for this one. That that's fine, I think, and then you have to lift the outer equivalences to to this level. Okay, so um, so what I'm saying now is uh, really in uh, in progress. So Claire told me this is an informal seminar, so that that's uh, that's allowed. Um, um, so the first thing 
So I haven't written the, the, these things up, and uh, but the thing I've thought about most of the technical problems, but I might have missed uh, something. So the thing I, I believe I can prove using uh, techniques that uh, Richard explained uh, in his talk um, is that if x is a generic cubic, so this uh, is, should be a risky open condition, then indeed the, uh, the image of rho should be the full group. Um, second, and this is a. No, here I mean read Sarisky open. I mean, I actually want to prove it for all. No, this I'm just talking about the image. Like for K3 service, always, the image is always, is always this. I'm not, so the kernel is, is of course different. Okay, so if X is very general, um, then this is what, what happens now. Then the kernel, again, should be very small. And if I look at, if I look at the image of rho, and only take those that act trivially on H to zero, so the symplectic ones, then this is a, is a group of order three. So they seem to be on a, gener a very general cubic, so they are the, the even shifts. Yes, so I was worried about the odd shift, but the odd shift is not symplectic, I'm sorry. So, and then there is something of order three. I don't know where it comes from. So it's there, but I don't, it seems to be there, but I don't know where it comes from. I don't have a construct. So there's, of course, no automorphism of a, of a generic uh, cubic of order three, but it seems, to, it seems to be there. And then the third thing is uh, this classification of finite subgroups um, applies also to this category AX. I get fewer groups here, uh, and I would like to describe those fewer groups that can actually act on, on AX. So X, there's an extra condition, but I will somehow... I messed up my computations and uh, couldn't get a nice result out of it. it it's, it's different, these groups. There are fewer groups, uh, but um, I don't have a nice answer like, like this one of uh, finite Gs in AX. Uh, yes, well, so I start from here. Every, every group occurring there will, will be one of those. But it should be smaller, and there. So, but I don't know how to phrase it nicely. So that's a. Uh, so I think I can. Yeah, right now, so I, for instance, I would like to avoid the Leech lattice and say I can reduce to the Niemeyer lattices, but that's uh, uh, that I don't know yet. I mean, the only thing I can say is once it is a group like this, the proof becomes easier, but not uh, the result doesn't become nicer. Okay. Uh, so there's one, one last, so maybe I should at least draw a little picture what the, how to, to get this. So I have, I have this period domain, that's my D. Okay, I take a very general point X here. And then I had these, uh, these, these, uh, is uh, loci of twisted K3 surfaces and of, uh, of uh, untwisted K3 surfaces and of twisted K3 surfaces. So the picture uh, is, is not very good because, in fact, these things are dense in the, in the period domain. Okay? So now I take, for instance, to prove, to prove um, the second statement for a very general uh, cubic, there's essentially nothing uh, acting trivially on cohomology. I use the deformation theory uh, Richard described and deform the Fuimukai kernel to a Tsarisky open um, set of X. So this X now will intersect uh, these uh, uh, K3 loci and also the twisted K3 loci. And I want to use this uh, result, uh, which is not on the board anymore, we had uh, with, um, with uh, Macri and Stellari that whenever there's no root, the kernel is easy. But now it could happen that I intersect the, so so twist, intersecting the, the K3 locus is not good because the outer equivalence group of an, a K3 surface untwisted is always complicated. So that doesn't help. So I really, at this point, I have to use these twisted K3 surfaces. But now it might happen that the twisted K3 surfaces uh, I intersect here, I find in here, 
uh, uh, do not have this property that there's no root. Okay? So there's another, uh, another criterion I have to, um, uh, I, I have to I, another locus I have to consider, which I call the spherical locus. And this is uh, the, uh, the intersection of D with all of, so this is the set of periods that do admit minus two classes. And uh, and I don't. So now I would like to say. So they're all of they're all of this uh, of this special type. So they are special special cubics in the sense of uh, of Hesed. And I'd like to give again a criterion in terms of D. So not divisible by some primes. And so I can't do this right now. But I have enough information. So for instance, if nine divides D, then this one is not uh, is not uh, twisted K three. So if uh, so if DD is some of these neutral Lefschetz devices and 9 divides D, then DD is not in the twisted K3 locus. And uh, using the density of those, uh, one can show that uh, the Sariski open set always intersects uh, the part uh, of twisted K3 surface with no roots. Then I apply uh, this uh, result by, uh, we had together with Macri and Stellari to show that on the deformation, the deformation of the fourier mukai functor has to be trivial or an even shift, and then to go back to, to x. Um, and maybe that's a perfect point to stop. OK, thank you. <laughs>